I have a feature film and we just went with some distributors and they asked me that. They go, like, what's your audience? And I was able to actually identify. I was like, mm-hmm. it's for parents who have children on the autism spectrum. And they go, good, you have an audience. They're like, most people say we want everyone to see our film. And then they go, then you have no one. Curiosity drives the best stories. And then telling that story carries within it so many beliefs and values and yep. principles. The best way to disguise a revolution is to tell a great story. I don't want to make a pity party. Like when I went and watched some of these other films around autism, it felt like they're going, ah, oh, sorry. I was like, I don't see anything to be like ashamed of. There's these incredible gifts. There's these incredible talents. Like I don't want to film just saying sorry. It was yeah. so fun just to be in these living rooms, mm. seeing these families celebrate their kids through their, their musical abilities. We just spent the last uh, like hour and a half with a, with a guy I was just telling Mark about that we were, we you know I had his book right here I had all these notes like it was the most prep I've ever done for an wow. interview wow wow we didn't talk I we didn't talk about a single one of the things I it's a good down. interview though <laughs> and right? it was it's awesome it's a, like it's it's like a live it was yeah. what was supposed to happen not just pre planned yeah I I had my journal I had all these questions I was gonna I I, lo- I love you know just doc film like I had all these questions <laughs> I wanted to ask and left it on the plane did you <laughs> yeah, oh did. no and I have all these documentary ideas in the back but no. I was like all right God I'm trust you there will just be some like fun conversation Do you put like your information in the Journal. Yeah, I have it because I have left journals before, and okay, uh, okay. someone once this this happened after church one day. I put my journal on top of my car. I was rushing to get to the airport. It's always the airport, and I drove, and my journal fell off. Some person in Toronto, bless her heart, found it, like thumbed through it, and saw someone's name that I had like written down to pray for. She knew that person, reached out, was like, "Do you know who this would be?" And they're like. Uh, they're like, oh, well, I actually, crazy. my friend Mark just said he lost his journal and reached out, sent me a pic. And then like, that's crazy. Yeah, actually. Yeah. It well, was crazy. Amazing. My journal is like my wallet kind of. Like, yeah. I keep yeah. more personal, like I keep like personal photos, my people I love in the back. Like I have one of those, was it moleskins? Moleskin, that had like the yeah, little envelope. Yeah. 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 I yeah, tuck yeah. things in there. I'll type little notes in there that people have written. And oh, that's, if I lose one, I feel, I'm like gutted. I'm like, frick, that was like a part of life. I know. I, I feel like I, I need to have the Apple air tag on it. Cause it's like, I realized <laughs> I was like, I would have rather lost my wallet. <laughs> because like yeah. that's replaceable but yeah. the journal is like that's my brain i was like <laughs> why don't i have an i have like an air tag on everything else but like i know not my thoughts i i <laughs> lost I, my mind we went on a run you run yeah. you run a lot we went on a run on well i used to run a lot but we're you know we ran on saturday and we were like you know we did this little like loop in la and then we got back to like the park that we all park our cars and there was just a dog. I don't know if a dog had gotten loose or someone had realized there was just like an apple tag in it. But there's just like an apple tag sitting on like the park bench. <laughs> it was just like someone freed themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Whether it might have been a stolen wallet, who knows? Oh but gosh, it, right? It, yeah, it could all be all the things. But I know yeah, I got into a, a, a Turo once. It was a guy's Tesla. And every time I got in, it would be like, there's an apple air tag near you. Because they do that now. They tell you there's an air tag because someone could be trying to track you. Yeah. Like someone could just drop an air tag on yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was just like, oh, this guy's like... I get it. You, you buy the Tesla for 100K or whatever, and then it's like, you want to know where it is. But I was just like, it felt weird. I was like, he's watching me wherever I go. Yeah, but I yeah, just read weird. that the uh, mayor of DC is giving free air tags to all the residents because there's so much car sa- theft. And uh, okay. because they don't have any good policies to stop crime, yeah. they're just basically telling people, we're going to let you track your own cars <laughs> and get them back, which is what happens in LA. We actually have had multiple cars stolen. We've had to track them down. We've had to go get them back. Man. And then afterwards, the police get involved and they do nothing. They do nothing, right? But Shout out to LAPD. <laughs> yeah. Because they do, you know, I don't know. But I honestly, I went on a date one time and I had the Apple tag. I, I had I was actually in your car and he has Apple tags on everything because yeah. he loses everything. So we Apple tag stuff for him. And the, the girl like got out and she was like, hey, like, are you Did tracking you, me? Are you tracking me? It sent me a screenshot <laughs> and it said Erwin McManus's Apple tag. And I was like, like, oh my God. You look at her, you're like, so that's my accountability partner. So yeah. I got to give him photo updates <laughs> <Yes>. right now. <laughs> and she's like, and she's like, she like literally just said like question marks. And I was like, oh. I was like, no, no, uh, you know, you were in, there was Apple tags in the car. So sorry, I didn't tell you. Yeah. yeah. That's an awkward, it's a great d- date icebreaker. I, I'm not even aware that there are any Apple tags in my life. What? What there, are you talking about? Like on your keys? <laughs> yeah, there's Apple tag on your keys. There actually might be one on your wallet. There's one in your shirt right now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. When you and think you turn your airplane mode on, ha ha ha. <laughs> I still got you. So what do I have Apple tagged? Oh, it, it's it's your office keys. Oh, okay. And my yeah. office keys. That's fine. Apple I'm nodding like I know that, but no, no. I, put, I keep keep one on one of my bags. We got yeah. we got to the point where I, I, we just lost our keys. because I we, know. We're, we never go to the, we're never the, well, I'm the first one in the office usually, but we have a code. So I always lose the keys. I gave my my mom 
the amount of times she calls me and she's like, can you pray for your dad to find his passport? So I just, for Christmas, I just like bought four Apple tags and just like put them on all his stuff. That's was like, I was like, a little nervous where we're talking about Apple tags and Aaron starts talking about a girl he went out with. And I'm going, please what? clarify, you did not Apple tag the girl. No, <laughs> you did. Yeah, actually. I was I'm sure car. people do that when they're like sus about their partner and like what's going on, like just oh. drop a tag in. But but then wow. you know that they're, they're, they're tracking you. Oh, this we, is actually messed up. That happened to a friend of mine. Whoa! Because his because his girlfriend thought this also just proves that there's just layers of issues here. But yeah, no, his girlfriend like he found an Apple tag in her the passenger side of the door, and he got the ping right. And so he's like, I can't find this thing for the white. He's like wow. sending it to the boys like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yo, there's like something in my yeah. car, and he finds it and like asks her like, hey, like, is this your Apple tag? She's like, oh my gosh, it must have fallen out of my purse. I'm like, it didn't fall out of your purse. It's well, Sherlock here's a good clue. It's so if, you scary have to, if you have to Apple tag yeah. the person you're dating, the, the wrong person yeah, to be there dating. There you go. There you go. <laughs> that's, that's the first sign of counts. You're like, that's what you first ask when, when there's problems in a marriage yeah. or whatever. You sit down, you're like, how many Apple tags do we have, folks? Yeah. yeah, what, uh, what, yeah, yeah show, me your, show me your pockets. First step in therapy. <laughs> yeah, first step in therapy. Put all yeah. your Apple tags on the <laughs> yeah. table. And they're, they're pulling them out of everything. You're like, okay, so we got 10 tag problem. Got, yeah. This is, this is going to be a big one. But as like a documentary filmmaker, you obviously have to keep your stuff in order and track everything everything I, so i do i, I try I to keep a few a few of the keep our office super low-key you know like we have yeah. like blacked out door and like just like above some like random business and like yeah. and then just yeah the gear you really do have to keep track it's not just phone keys wallet it's like camera lenses memory cards all that everything yeah See, and i already I, have a documentary for you you need to have an apple tag okay you give it to someone you say i want you to have this apple tag for three days and then i want you to pass it on to someone who passes it on in three days and see how far across the world that Apple tag. Oh, can that's travel. actually. Can I do that? Will you let me do that? Yeah, I think. Yeah, that's it. yeah. It you, really you, you can be executive producer on that. <laughs> I'll give you that. No, that's that a. Really I, I like that. that would be a fun thing on the YouTube yeah. channel. It's just like, it, but you have but make it the thing that after three days you have to give it to someone. Yeah, and and maybe you know like, make a combination. Someone that's important to you, but someone who's further away from you. Wow, and, and is the rule that you have to physically give it? Or you could, or you, you could, could mail to them, but they have mail, to. They have to pick it up. But I think it's oh, better if you physically. Get I think it's physical because that's cool. Because then, then, be yeah, then the human passing. has to travel. Yeah, right? then yeah, it's yeah, going yeah. from yeah. place to place to place, and you watch that tag travel across the country, then or maybe oh, across the world. And It'd be pretty amazing. At the core of that, what do you think it's saying? Is it like that that we we have to be physically connected to each other? Or well, I just think it. Um, one, it will show how interconnected we actually are. Yeah. Across the world, yeah. when there's so much division and divisiveness in the world. And you can say we're all part of the same story. Imagine it getting to some locations right now, yeah. like seeing that appear yeah. in some areas. That, so I know that I could Apple tag, and within one person, it'll be in either Israel or Palestine. Yeah, I know within one tag, one person in my life, it could be in Ukraine or in Russia. Like I, I already know that I could hand physically hand it to one person, it could go around the world instantly. So I have a, an Apple tag here. <laughs> and we, I think I need to give it to one of you guys we and, we'll start, and we'll start the doc today. We could start to, we could start, start, start with Aaron. Maybe we get yeah, back. Yeah, 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 yeah. back. <laughs> just <be> like, hi, <laughs> will you take this? You got to give it in three days. Yeah. You do? Because I already have it. I already tracked. Oh, that's, we so, should, that's so interesting. It's yeah. an interesting concept. It is just to see it. Actually, it's like kind of six degrees of separation, but in the sense of like that we're actually that's always like, did you know, did you know this? Did you know that person? But that's just through like thought and connection. This yeah. is like physically, because yeah. just even yeah, how the, we the, ran into to Ui. Yeah, like, literally, I, I, I went to meet him out and I went to take him to, the, to, to, to this, to like show him something. And then we ran into a friend of his. Just like that. I'm always, yeah. I'm always like, how many times has that happened? I think we've all had that thought. Yeah, you know? we, we were in London and we went to a clothing store and we met a couple that were there on their honeymoon from Amsterdam. Yeah. And they came up to us and said, we love your podcast. Yeah, wow. And I said, do you live here? And they said, no, we're just here on a honeymoon. And yes, that's right. And the store behind the hotel in Shoreditch. Yeah. yeah. What are the chances of walking into a store and then a couple comes up and immediately comes up and says, we love Mind Shift. Yeah. Yeah. And we're here on a honeymoon from Amsterdam. And so wow. I think the world is so much more interconnected than we could ever imagine. I've, I've always wondered that when it's like, people are like, what's the first question you ask God when you get to heaven? I'm like, play me all the times that I just missed like someone. Like I just would like to see that as like, with the, if we all had Apple Air tags, like yeah. just seeing like, it just, I don't know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it would be inconsequential. I'm sure there's better things like, yeah. like why did the dinosaurs die or something? But it's like, that, I wanna know like how many times did I just yeah. like, Walk past. No, I, I this. I'm on like a conspiracy kick right now. I feel like I would ask, like, actually, who created the pyramids? 
Oh, so you 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 you're, 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 you're into Doctor Grant? I'm, I'm yeah. into. Uh, well, is Grant, well, what's it, is it Grant Williams? What's his? Uh, I think it. No, uh, no, what's his I'm, name? I'm, don't guy. don't do names with me. That's bad. But <laughs> no, I know. I think it's Grant. But yeah, I know who you're talking. About. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just into Joe Rogan. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just I'm playing it shallow. I like, <laughs> not that Joe shallow, but I I I I just am always interested in the things he's talks talks about it. But then we we've had this conversation a dozen times because he's from El Salvador. And there's pyramids in El Salvador. Oh, there's pyramids. Uh, yeah, Guatemala. Yeah, yeah, there's some yeah. in El Salvador. So ancient, you know, um, spaces where they they dug up in El Salvador found um, a civilization that was I think over three thousand years old, and they found um, the um, artifacts of a religion that was monotheistic that believed in a trinity. Whoa! In El Salvador, three thousand years ago. That's and did like it was like. I'm just waiting to like, did they find like tracks and like other church things? <laughs> in there? They found like they volunteer. Found a bunch of hoodies. They found, they found a decision a card. They found a decision card. Found a lot of merch. <laughs> yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. They found, they found a lot of buckets. And oh my gosh. And yeah, some tides and all. But it was yeah. like, you know, just like gold coins. That's like coconuts. And there, I read a book, the, I think it was like the Lost Monkey Tribe. I, I'm again, names don't, but it was, it was about, it was in Honduras and okay. it was like supposed to be like the last discover, but a, you know, it's, I guess it's happening everywhere right now, but it was yeah. a city that they really, they had to really journey to, and that was just half the book was them actually getting there. Mm. And what what was crazy about that book too is like the cartel, or I guess not the cartel, but the the drug runners are like closing in. They're the they're the first frontier in that forest because uh. they're the craziest people who would go in and actually like be up against these anacondas and all these animals. But they, uh, what's so interesting with these older civilizations is one of the key indications they see in terms of their development is is around the windows. Is it ornate? Like is in and you know I've been in Mexico and seen like some of the Aztec stuff. There would actually be spaces for almost like flowers and like very ornate. And it's like you realize how advanced some of these people were. The mm. fact that they're at the point where they're they, they're caring about like homemaking. You know, yeah, like yeah, like yeah. like yeah. what does my space look like? You know, mm. if you're if you're like a tribe on the cusp of survival, you're not going to be like like so. What tile do we choose? Yeah, but it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. The, when you see these. Well, I mean, this view that human history is nonstop progressive development is incredibly inaccurate. Yeah. And it, it you know, the, um, the artifacts, the architecture, um, all, all the evidence we have of ancient civilizations tell us that human history doesn't work this way. It doesn't work step by step by step. Uh, you know, there were, there were eras where um, mathematics and architecture and um, you know, their view of physics, it, it, it just was at a whole different level, different times. And, uh, you know, you have this Egyptian empire that's so extraordinary, right? You have the Phoenicians who were so extraordinary. And, um, and, and but you can also sometimes see it where the, um, the empires of the Persians and where, um, where this nation, this empire was so progressive and then it regresses. Mm. But you can even see it in the last hundred years hmm. when yeah. you see photographs of the Middle East Yes, this is true. And of the Syria, um, had of Syria of, and Iraq yeah. and Israel and Lebanon and Jordan. And it looks like um, really advanced modern cultures. And then 20 years later, every because of Sharia law, everything goes back like a thousand years. And you don't realize that those nations look like LA and New York and London and Paris. Yeah. And then overnight uh, regress a thousand years. and. Who are we to think that 2,000 years ago, the world did not aggress, regress 1,000 years because of conquest? Hmm. And, you know, civilizations advanced because of the Greeks and the Romans and the Egyptians. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, and, you, you know, the, you know we, we forget that, you know, different empires brought different aspects of civilization. Mm -hmm. And then when, you know, when a different, uh, when an empire collapses, a lot of times civilizations regress too. And so I'm kind of wondering, I mean, I would love to be able to go back, you know, 3000 years Absolutely. and see where human history was. Hmm. I, I want to know what, what is the casual conversations back then? Because uh, the, 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 probably the issue that I've had is when you think back to these, organ these civilizations, you assume that they're, they're not as smart as us. You know, there's this idea that they're kind of like, like just more simple. But I'm like, when I go look, I was looking at, been reading about turbulence, really fascinated about the idea of turbulence. Like that's one thing that science has not been able to create mathematical equations around. Like we, we know quantum mechanics and we which is insane, but turbulence is something that, you know, you will take thousands of computer cores and it can render out turbulence off a wing, but it takes like a week to do that, like over like a four second period. But Da Vinci 
would draw turbulence in really accurate ways. And I'm like, this is someone who had a lot of time to look at that and think about that. And so then I'm like, we always look at their really intelligent ideas, but I'm like, what were they just like, hmm. how, how did they just like, you know, shoot the breeze? Like what, I, I don't, I want to yeah. know, like, was it just politics? Like what, what was, what was, what was those conversations? That's, that's where my mind, like, cause we always think about these big ideas, but I'm like, what were the small ideas? Were they like arguing like, like if mauve is like the new like like silk to wear or something like I, <laughs> see I this know. is why you're a filmmaker <laughs> yeah this is where my mind goes yeah. <laughs> and well, well, it, i mean because i think in the end curiosity drives the best stories yes yes and um and and then telling that story carries within it so many beliefs and values and yeah. principles and you know the the best way to disguise a revolution is to tell a great story Say, uh, break that down for me. <laughs> and, uh, um, if you want to change the way a people live mm. or see the world, yeah. just spread a story. Yeah. Like when, when a million people are captive and all they've known all their lives is captivity and bondage yeah. and yeah. they think this is what the world is and then you tell a story about a man who lived free. Mm story of someone who was able to pursue their dreams mm. a story of someone whose family lives in open fields and their children run and laugh and play and dream that story will begin to spread and mm. and someone will go well if that story can be true for that person why can't it why it can't be for me stories are are subversive wow and they're powerful so to to, to change a society or or a group of people do you have to tell a story that connects to their desire like the, the, what they don't have is or their like, fears their fears okay yeah and you know it's i grew up because i'm older than both of you being taught as a child in school to get under my desk hmm. in case there's a nuclear bomb that drops yeah. from russia yeah like that would do anything <laughs> Well, that, I, I, I don't know. It's just like super confused. Do you, do you know what those desks are made of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Nothing yeah, would yeah. exist. Yeah. No, but but um, but there's multiple stories being told there. Mm -hmm. One is we need to be in fear. Yeah. That there is another there's empire. A, there's, an en there's an enemy yeah. that wants yeah. to destroy yeah. us. Yeah. 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 And somehow hiding under that desk is the safest place to be. <laughs> so, but they're also teaching us conformity and order. Yeah. Obey yeah. us, or you won't live. Wow. So there, there are layers of yeah, things. We've experienced that a lot. <laughs> yeah, that are, that are being taught. Yeah. Um, you know, without being political, like Roe versus Wade was a story that was well-crafted mm -hmm. to advance a very particular mm -hmm. value system. If you look back at any political shift in American society or in, uh, anywhere in the Western world or anywhere across human history, there was a story that people became convinced of. Yeah. You know, whether it's, um, you know, the government is evil or or they're good yeah yeah <laughs> right yeah. you know and yeah. um that this belief system will destroy you or it will save you yeah you yeah. know and so muhammad had a story that revolutionized the middle east i mean think about it there was a tuesday where islam didn't exist <laughs> yeah, <it's true. laughs> and, uh, and then by wednesday it had taken over a massive section of the world wow uh, stories are powerful they, and they and they do convince people that they need to shape their lives around that story. Was it Stalin who said, uh, like a million people who die is, is a stat, but one person dying is a tragedy? Mm -hmm. Like that idea that, we're always telling this with the, with the, the documentary academy, right? we're on people bring these stories for aid organizations and, and all our churches or whatever, and they're, they're trying to tell of a big problem in society and they go so big and it's like, that's abstract. I don't know what a million looks like. Mm -hmm. Like, show me, I, I couldn't tell you. If you yeah, showed me a group of people, I'd say 500,000, you know, like, I don't know yeah, that. Yeah. But then if you can hone in on that one person, they can represent a big group of people. Thank you, because we had an earlier conversation what? in our mastermind, the arena. Yesterday? Yeah. Yesterday. Okay. And someone asked me the question. They said, my coaches keep telling me I need to write a book to a very specific audience. I keep telling them my book is for everyone. Oh, and <laughs> and we're, we're fighting over it. Yeah. And what do you have to say? And I said, well, first of all, why do you have coaches if you don't want to listen to them? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and sec secondly, you're not looking for coaches, you're looking for cheerleaders. Yeah, I saw that quote. What, what, yeah. what does that mean? <laughs> it's when you ask more than one person for advice, you're looking for agreement. 
because you okay you yeah, get advice yeah. from one person they yeah. don't give you the advice you want so you go to another <laughs> you go to someone else yeah. until you finally find the person who agrees with you yeah so you're not looking for advice or insight or wisdom you're looking for agreement well, what about groupthink? what about when you have groupthink is terrible okay. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, does like, anyone does any group still believe in groupthink? <laughs> i know, I know you're like, we'll show our film we'll do feedback where you, you it's good to know how a few different people perceived a piece of art you've created and like mm -hmm. did you all like because that's an audience right and mm -hmm. if it's disconnecting with three out of the four you're like oh, but that's not groupthink okay see when you're getting feedback from individuals i see they're not thinking in the group. Yeah, yeah. Because what happens once you're in group think is the group tells you how to think. Yeah, yeah. And then that then that's a ship without a without right. a rudder. <laughs> so in and I said, look, if you want to write a book that touches everyone, yeah. you have to write a book for one person. Yes, absolutely. And because when I write a book, there's someone I care about, someone I love. There's yeah. a problem I'm trying to solve in their life, and this book is really my gift to them. Yeah. And then I know if I can speak to that person, it speaks to everyone. And you just said that about documentary filmmaking. Yeah. And because uh, I could imagine people going, my documentary is for everyone. <laughs> I have a feature film and we just went with some distributors and they asked me that. They go like, what's your audience? And I was able to actually identify. I was like, mm -hmm. it's for parents who have children on the autism spectrum. And and I go, it's, it's for those families. And they go, good, you have an audience. They're like, most people say we want everyone to see our film. And then they go, then you have no one. Like if it's everything, then it's nothing. It's like, it's like, it's like when you go to the, the pop machine and you hit every button. It's like that's it's swamp water. It's it's like there is no flavor. It's like mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. You're 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 is swamp water. You're you're advocating everything I believe in in terms of the creative process. Yeah, yeah. You, you you have to. Or otherwise you just reach super fans. If you're just yeah. doing a topic, yes. like if you want to yeah. make a film about dirt yes. biking and there's no main character story, dirt bikers will watch it because they're they see themselves. They mm -hmm. they're the story. But my mom's not gonna see that. She'll be like, yeah. like, does he have kids? Like what's yeah. he about? You know, like they <laughs> No, but that's a perfect example. If you have a story about a dirt biker, yeah. and that's what the story is, everyone who loves dirt biking. But if it's a story about a guy who overcame polio, a huge like For sure. tragedy in his yeah. life, and then became a dirt biker. Yeah. And then fell in love with a girl who yeah you know, yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> you know now the story is actually becoming for everyone the, it becomes <laughs> a ryan gosling movie the way yeah, <laughs> a great another beautiful canadian um they, uh this, this is what we always explain to to our students is is that the physical journey like like so the dirt biker i want to win this race like that that reaches the built-in audience so you, dirt bikers they want to know like how did he get that race but the, the metaphysical or the emotional journey other people will connect to that because we all have emotions. We all know what it's like to want to win a race for it to represent something. Like I, I just did a, a half marathon and I wanted to beat my time from half my age. So it's like that was my personal best was when I was 18 and I'm twice that. And so I was like, I want to beat that time. There's all, and if you made a film about that, it would be connected to some deep desire of like trying to extend my my lifespan or my health span. And so it's like that's what people would people would know that feeling of like trying to beat their younger self but that's that's the f emotional journey no, i love it you talked a little bit about um oh shoot i just i literally just went blank what are we talking about oh you talked a little bit about your documentary it's called okay for now for it's, now oh, we, we, okay. so, no. so it's okay <laughs> yeah it's okay i i i you know i'll say it in here i like I'm, I'm bummed we we had to change the name but but it in order to reach that audience you know i had a long discussion i really stuck my foot in the mud with the distribution company we're working with but they ultimately were like, we can get this film in front of more organizations and more families if they can see like, you know, ASD Band the movie is what it's called now. It used to be OK, the ASD Band film. I think it's a bit pedantic. I think OK was a better name, but it only really meant something to me because I was like, it's OK to be on the spectrum. It's a, like one of the main characters would say OK in the film a lot. It was just like, it's OK. And, and I, all the artists who I talk to, they're like, oh, you're changing it. But I'm like, if it's going to help the film reach further. So what's it called now? It's called ASD Band the movie. A a autism spectrum disorder band. So the band that the film is about is a, it, they're a group of really talented musicians who are all on the autism spectrum and at varying degrees of, of, um, of like, of life function. And so they- uh, But that, that seems like a, an even more esoteric title. ASD band, the movie. Because yeah, you have to know about that band you have to know what that means, That's, what his initial means. So that kind of confirms what the, what, what, what the people I was working with were saying. They're like, when you say ASD band the movie, people think, oh, I should know who they are. Like there's there's yeah. an inference that yeah. that they're 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 yeah. big and it and it's kind of fun. They're it's such a fun <laughs> film. Like I didn't want to make a film. My whole what I wrote down in my journal, which it's on an airplane somewhere. So if someone, uh, <laughs> yeah, I left it on an Air Canada flight. flight in, and I, I forget that. But, uh, <laughs> at, uh, it was left six fifteen from Toronto this morning. Um, they. Uh, 
I didn't want to make a film like I wrote in my journal. Before, I, I always write, have to write a, a goal that I have. And I was like, I don't want to make a pity party. Like when I went and watched some of these other films and I won't name some of these uh, um, reality TV series around autism. It felt like they're going, ah, oh, sorry. You yeah, know, like yeah. it felt like they were apologizing. Yeah. And I got around these families and met these. The, I, was, I was brought in by this, uh, the producer in the film, Andrew Simon. And it was, he, he welcomed me to, to tell their story because he was the, he helped create the band. Mm. And uh, I was like, I don't, I, don't, I don't see anything to be like ashamed of. Like there's, mm. there's these incredible gifts. There's these incredible talents. Like I don't want to film just saying sorry about, you know, that's why it's not called yeah. sorry. It's like, yeah. it's okay. And it was one of the most fun films I've ever made. A lot of my films have gone into more like mm. uh, challenging places or like war-torn countries or, you know, embedded myself with some paramedics in Dominican before there was 911. So mm. like really hectic places. And so yeah. it was so fun just to be in these living rooms, mm. seeing these families celebrate their kids mm. through their, their musical abilities. And then they wrote and recorded their first album together and that was fun. And yeah, it was, it was an eye-opening experience. That's amazing. So tell us a little bit about how you got started in documentary filmmaking. Yeah, I, I enjoyed kind of everything in high school, which again, then, then you enjoy nothing. So I didn't know, you know, like I just enjoyed. I was I, the same way. Yeah. I mean, you can enjoy everything. You just get paid for nothing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you're, right, you're like, you're like what, are, what do I do with this? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I just, you know, took some of that confusion and just was like, oh, like I'll do something altruistic. So I, I went and joined uh, like a humanitarian organization and was, was over overseas. Uh, working in Egypt during the Darfur War, um, oh, wow. where all the refugees were fleeing. Wow. It was a civil war, the north and south. And, and so there was millions and millions of people being displaced. Um, and so I was in this Coptic church in just the desert, and there was a group of doctors working with uh, the refugees. And I had no medical training. I was just this like emo 18 year old kid with the swoopy <laughs> hair. And they were just like, you know, <laughs> I can't. Long I can't. Lost cousins. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, can't, I can't administer any medical training. So they're just like, just talk to them. You know, they're. We, we have hundreds of refugees coming through here. When they get to us, they, mm. they want to tell their stories, but we just need to keep treating them. We need to keep moving through. But, mm. like, but it's really important for them to get that. That's part of their health is this mm. and being able to unload these stories. So I just, for weeks, just sat there and would just go around this, like in this church, in these pews. And there's people from, they're Muslims, they're Christians. Mm. And I started just hearing such tremendous heroics. They mm. had left their businesses. They had lost family members. They had mm. walked days on end. They had, you know, so much that they had overcome, but they were the most kind and and brave and positive people I'd met. And so mm. I came back to Canada with with these stories on my mind and and I was shoot, I was I was the only one who knew the editing software. So I'd do that for the aid organization. And then again I was like I had so much fun editing the video, but I had so much fun I didn't mm. think that can't be my career. Like that's too fun. So I worked construction for a year, <laughs> and then <laughs> same, <laughs> same thing. And no. then it was it was luckily a, a great friendship with my dad. And my dad saw me just like not eating one day, editing videos all day, and was like, "I think you're a filmmaker. Like you always talk about these stories and you're editing video." And him calling that out, and you know he he's a pastor himself, and a lot of people always were kind of putting on me like, "Oh, you'll you'll go into ministry." And I, I never never I wasn't like it's not that I'm like opposed to operating inside the church, but I just I wasn't the thing. Um, and so it was him calling that out, being like, I think you're a filmmaker. So applied to film school and kind of rest is history, but always have wanted, you know, a lot of my early films were, were with humanitarian organizations. And that's where the kind of the passion is. I love untold stories of people in existential crisis. Like those are heroes to me. Mm. I don't care about Sp Spider-Man, Superman. Like those are people connect with those stories. And I, and I know that because I ripped on Marvel Universe on one of my YouTube videos recently and yeah, people came at me. Yes. People came, I thought, I was I, just like, I'm the, like, you guys take this serious? The comments are wild. Yeah, they yeah. came at me. And so, because I was like, I like films that are rooted in reality. And and I just thought like, I was like, I can't get into a guy with a big hand. Like, like that's the-, the yeah. big, Unless it's like actually a guy with a really <laughs> yeah, big hand. Yeah, I want to make that film. But, <laughs> Kawhi Leonard, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, you're welcome, by the way. We, yeah. we, we, we lent uh, them out to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. What are you doing with them? It's not been a gift to us. Oh, what are you doing? Yeah, what are you, you doing? You guys clearly ruined him. Oh, you, you, I mean, that loss to the Knicks. Come on. Oh, jeez. Did they lose last night? Let's just it was terrible. <laughs> I, I gave up. I started watching. I started watching a Marvel movie. I, I literally just go. flipped up and was like, "I'll watch anything else." Yeah, and that felt more rooted in reality. Hey, oh, compared I to mean, the way. I, I just, feel. I do feel bad for you guys whenever I see them losing. I'm like, that must be tough having all that talent. And then uh, oh, we are. It's such a reflection of my 20s, that team. <laughs> <laughs> like so much potential and no, nothing, to, nothing to show for it. But we're getting hardened with such a, such a interesting moment. Yeah, yeah. Is that a gift? No, it's not. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's a not. great social experiment. 
to remind us that all the talent in the world cannot overcome a bad culture. Yeah, yeah. And you have to have an organizational culture that elevates people beyond their talent. Yeah. It just doesn't feel like there, this is a tangent, but it doesn't feel like there is any culture with that team. It doesn't feel like Tyrone Which is brings, a any bad culture, culture. brings any culture. Because it means that it's really culture submitting the talent. Was Doc the coach for a bit? Was yeah, he? And Doc was, yeah. But he's no, and now it's he's in Philly. Yeah, but yeah. but did I would have thought he would have brought good culture? Or what did you see? It wasn't a great culture, but it was better. Yeah, yeah. but I don't think yeah. it's. Ty, I, I I you don't think it's Ty Lu? I well, you know, I mean, we're going to the sports right now, but I'm going to say, I think great cultures can only be developed with patience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's mm -hmm. not that mm -hmm. Tyloo doesn't have the ability to build a great culture or doc or something like that. It's it's true in everything. It, you know, I mean, I think one of the challenges if we wrap this back to filmmaking is when you're putting together a, a crew, if they're a new crew every single time, yeah, it's really hard to actually have a great culture. Yeah. yeah. Because people bring their own stuff into that moment. And then when you have the same crew, you can actually build the culture over time. Absolutely. And so I think the difference is um, the Clippers haven't necessarily had the patience to build mm -hmm. a great organizational culture it, over time. It's so funny you, you bring bring that up. I was I was reading, I think it was in, I asked one of my friends who actually did the humanitarian school with, he's now a pastor. And I said, what's what's the thing that God, what's the new idea that you've learned about God this year? Because he's mm -hmm. really, I, I really appreciate his mind. And he sat there and he goes, uh, he's like, God moves way slower. Like God is like, God moves slow. He goes, if the earth is 6 million years old, like it took a while just to even bring like civilizations. And then like, you know, it took a while from like Jesus to come around. And, and, and then funny, I was reading a book by Peter Scazzaro that day and they talked about the early church. We often in church culture are like, you gotta build your church quick. Gotta like go hard, hard, hard. And we often reference the first church, but they were known, like some of the desert fathers spoke about them. They were known for that they moved slow and patient. And that mm -hmm. brought about a really strong culture. Mm -hmm. And I, I, funny, all of this is, I, I love connections. I recorded a video yesterday about the best DP and director uh, collaborations and why, and I'm, mm -hmm. the whole video at the core of it, my teaching point was cl collaboration and familiarity is sometimes, mm -hmm. like familiarity actually might be the key to you unlocking, like having people who know you, who you can actually call each other out or that you know your shorthand. Because we often look to that, I need to be with this person. Or mm -hmm. if I just meet this one person, then my life will change. But it's like, these, these, the same best, you know, all these amazing Spielberg working with the same DPs, you know, like Tarantino would work with Robert Richardson on many films. Like they just, mm. they find familiarity and then they don't change it. And mm. there's, there's something, I think novelty doesn't necessarily mean progress. Mm -hmm. mm. And either there's talent. Talent doesn't mean progress, yeah. Yeah, and that's, I think the thing is that, you know, just connecting to where we start yeah. with the Clippers is that they're trying to almost inf impose culture with talent. Yeah. And talent yeah. doesn't bring culture. Yeah. In fact, talent needs culture to direct it, to yeah. harness it, and to um, to actually make it a positive element or ingredient to the whole. Yeah. It's just like if you have an actor who's only focused on themselves, they can actually ruin the whole movie. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And and you know, and, and I, I think that it's like Aaron, when you were driving you know, a community in Venice Beach. I mean, you worked really hard at creating an organizational culture mm. that created both fun and hard work mm. at the same time. Yeah. And it's not that easy to do. That's no. not easy. No. How, how did you make it fun? By just being ridiculous. <laughs> Honestly, that's, I, that's as simple as I can say it. I would make like our team meetings. I'd be like our team, I'd make everyone meet at the beach. Well, not make. I'd be like, hey, we're having a team meeting. Yeah. We're doing it at the beach, yeah. which is everyone's sure optional. Close, but yeah, sure. <laughs> but also when you get to the beach, I'm going to be in the water. Oh, that's So fun. if you, there's 20 surfboards. This is good. If you want to meet, yeah. get the surfboard, get in the water. And I have people who are terrified of the ocean being like, I hate you, by the way, like <laughs> swimming out, hating me, yelling, and then being out there. And we would just meet. Mm. Then we'd surf and we'd hang. And I was like, nothing that we do, if, if the work that we produce comes from a place of, exhaustion or anger then it's not going to be lit. it's not going to have the life that we actually yeah. want to have man fun, fun is so we yeah that that is i i got to experience uh, mosaic uh, venice years ago and and i remember your huddle with your team ahead mm. i 
Um, Which location was it? It was the one right off of um, um, Abbot Kinney. Oh, so oh, it was yeah, a school. Yeah, yeah the school. Oh, cool. Yeah, I remember it was there, was like, there was like a lion or like a yeah. tiger. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I can remember your guys' huddle before church. Yeah, the way if, you, if I had to describe it with one word, it was fun. And yeah. maybe like with a like a subtitle of energy. It was yeah. like, it was so fun and it wasn't heavy. Yeah. And it was like, I wasn't even on team, but I think I went and just like, oh no, we were there to like learn. So we just, I just went on team with, uh, I was with a gentleman too from your from your church. He was a uh, uh, blind, I believe. In, oh, uh, Brian. Yeah. 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 And yeah. I just heard a podcast. I think he was on the podcast mm-hmm. I listened to. And so he taught me how to do echo uh, loca- location. location. It's crazy. Uh, and that was, uh, but the energy and the, f- yeah, I, I just had fun that day. And that was like, they, they, we sometimes like worry about what people will think of our film or our art, but often the question is like, what did you feel? You know, that's mm. what you'll remember and that's what you'll carry yeah. with. And it's like, oh, yeah. That's so funny. I didn't even, I, I'm sure you told me this years ago, but I, it's actually crazy to me. I didn't realize you were, you were there with Brian. Brian yeah. always stressed me out because he's blind and he plays bass. <laughs> he'd play in, the, on, uh, in the music. And, but we always had like these, you know, like cheesy steel decks or whatever, but you know, he's a big guy. Yeah. And yeah. I'm like, Oh, just make sure Brian doesn't fall. Like, <laughs> there's never any railings, and he'd always he, be on he there. He can like ride bikes, right? If it's yeah. quiet he rides, enough. Yeah, he mountain bikes. Yeah, two days ago, <laughs> I, two days ago, I saw him on crutches. Did he fall? He, you know, he does crazy, dangerous stuff. Just crazy, dangerous stuff. Oh He's all, you know, the, the yeah. people who are fully quote sighted, you know, yeah. <laughs> don't do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Literally so runs he, into brick walls. Yeah, like, he might have yeah. to have knee surgery. And I thought, man, that guy. What a legend. He, he just he really has no special. limits. And no. I, I, I want to go back. Uh, I, um, I can't remember who it was. Somebody spent a hundred million dollars on a movie and it was terrible. And that's, they, that's happened a few times. Yeah, and they, <laughs> they they said no one sets out to make a bad movie. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Uh, and so when you're one, I'm assuming you've had documentaries you thought were great and the ones you thought, you know, didn't quite you know make yep. it. You know, yep. or maybe even were terrible. Yeah. And how soon in the process do you know? It's more so than my commercials that I've, because my documentaries, I feel like I get a lot of autonomy on. It's commercials. And I know usually that a commercial is going to be bad, but I always say you're, it's okay to be stressed when creating a film. It's not okay to be confused. And if I feel any confusion, I'm like, if I'm supposed to be sailing the ship and I'm not sure what's, like, it's okay to not know. Yeah. yeah but when yeah. I'm like, and, and I think the big thing is to come back to familiar, familiarity is when I feel like my process is no longer mine. Because when you go into a commercial set, commercials are the worst. You have you have two things working against you. Well, three things. One, usually bad creative. And so, but you can <laughs> overcome that with, with, other, with other things. But then you have um, a group of people who all have salaries. And when you have salaries, someone's paying you. And when someone's paying you, they can fire you. And so when you're in a creative environment where everyone is, is salary-based, they're not just like freelancers, where they can do a bad job and just go to the next one. Right when you're with agencies and their salary, people are so afraid to make mistakes. So you have everyone choosing safe options. And um, and then you have everyone too, where they need to prove their worth of their salary. And so they have to show that their creative influence was on the project. So you have everyone giving their opinion. And then I find, I remember I did this was one big job. It was like somehow I landed this global campaign for, for a big camera company and, I, you know, I'd come from doing eight organization videos for like four grand, like literally, like where I'd lose money. And then I was given $4 million to do this doc series around the world. And that was actually bad. That was, I wasn't, wasn't ready for it. It took, took me doing four of the films and on the fourth one, the fourth one I love now and it's, I have it on my website, but the yeah. first three were pretty bad. Were yeah. pr- well, yeah. they were terrible. We can call it out. <laughs> and they, they knew they couldn't fire the director. I felt bad. I brought on one of my friends who's a cinematographer and they fired him just because they're like, we need to fire someone. And I, that, that always, that, they, that sucked. And because they were like, you know, they, they had committed to me already and signed a contract and they probably wanted to fire me. But finally, like it had gone so bad the first few because there I'm supposed to be shooting a dock and I look behind me and there's three coach buses, three coach buses, Jeez. like a hundred people. And I'm on this little tiny, they had the, the idea is we shot these documentaries about photographers on the cameras, on the company's camera. Yeah. And it was like, it's just, it was, it, it was a recipe for disaster when you have that much because that's a film set and you're asking me to do an intimate documentary. And they just, the process, that's why I was not mm. familiar with that. That's where I knew it was going wrong. And so it finally, when we finally got to the fourth film, I was just like, I've just shot three really crappy projects. I was mm. like, so I, who cares what happens? I just told them, I was like, you gotta let me do this my way. I was like, can we reduce the crew and can we shoot some extra days? Like, cause it, you're trying to cram everything into such short amount of days. And then mm. it's like, there's no time to be like, 
ask questions on set. And I think they were just like, well, it can't get any worse. Yeah, we might, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you only do four? Uh, we did four, yeah, four, okay. four different photographers. Okay. So they were just ready to be done. Yeah, yeah, like, yep, just with the just fourth, go. and they were yeah, like, yeah, yeah. they were like, and so, and I also told them this, this was a little tip. I was like, I used to fly in always to Europe for all of them, and they would put me right into the most important meetings the first day, and I'd come, it's always overnight flights from Toronto, mm -hmm. and I'd arrive just completely jet lagged, and I would just want to get the meetings over with, so I was just like saying yes a lot, and so, thank you, and so, um, Long story short is I just told them, I was like, give me two days just to sleep in a bed, not talk to anyone. Like fly me in early, I'll even pay for my hotel. And, and that was like, actually just, you hear all this stuff about sleep deprivation. That was just really helpful to be like <laughs> awake. And uh, long story short though, I uh, the, the fourth one, we, we were able to go through that process, went much slower, got to go just off on my own sometimes with the DP and the camera and the character. Mm. And that film ended up, we got nominated for uh, best best commercial at the Cyclope Awards up against Apple's Way Home commercial, like like Spike Jones, who's my one of my heroes in filming. Yeah. I was like, see my name. Uh, that that yeah. was like one of the. It was like, and then finally, I was like, oh, it was when I can actually. I need to lean into my process. Like I need not be insecure, even though my process looks so different than others, and maybe yeah. my process looks lower budget. Yeah, but that's yeah. that's who I am, and I can't. Like I started making films by myself with a camera. I don't like even even uh, Wes mm. Anderson. He gets them to hide all the film trucks. Uh, and he sits on an Apple box, like this far away from the actors. Yeah. And he says, I don't want to see lights. I don't want to, like, he wants it to, he's like, I want it to feel like a student film. It's like, yeah. well, this is what someone who's worked with him on commercials was telling yeah. me. And I was like, that was really re reaffirming That's to be like, amazing. you know, some of the biggest directors yeah. want it to feel small. And I don't think big is necessarily better. It no. doesn't produce better art. So if you could, uh, I want to dive into that, that, the first three films that you, that you shot there. So w do you feel that it was because the, it was, they were trying to enforce a process that didn't make you feel comfortable or did, or did or did you feel that it was you you needed to go about it a completely different way yeah it they my, my process is i i as i f i will work into the magic you know like i don't over plan i've learned i've over the years i've developed that skill because i realized you know if i'm going to make it as a commercial director which i'm kind of not doing as much anymore mm. but i was like if i'm going to make it as a commercial director i need to be able to go in with like a really strong game plan which is also mm. sometimes helpful because then you can get ahead of schedule and then you can allow time mm. for the the creative mm -hmm. um like just um abstract moments but i i i don't want to i don't ever want to pass blame on anyone if i had uh I, I wonder if i i just don't think the project was i think they wanted an intimate doc but they had their process and their process was commercials mm. it was like big you know this was a global campaign which everyone feels like they have to spend that money, you know, to justify yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So um, I was young, I was I was still in my 20s. And so I, I had it been now, and what this, this is why I don't shoot many commercials anymore, is my agent knows that I, I'm like, I, it needs, you know, if they ask for two days, give me four and cut the crew in half. And, mm, I, and yeah. some agencies just won't, they don't know, yeah. they don't, and, they, and I'm like, an agency can't be there for half the shoot. It's not because I don't like them, it's just that yeah. it won't, if you're asking me to do a doc story and there's yeah. a gaggle of people all sitting on this couch in a monitor and you're asking just a normal person to go be normal, like, yeah. it's like, it's, it's the worst. When we shoot, I like to, to, I like it to be like this. I like it to feel, I like, to, I like to be a sense of randomness Yeah, that feels like you, un, uncontrollable variables. Uh, earlier in, we, in, the, in the morning, they had like a, a lift going every like literally five minutes and that was a little bit brutal. This but time it's so quiet. So quiet. But luckily, our, our our don't say that. It's gonna, I know, we're going to be here. Beep. But the, <laughs> but there's something about like the creative process that when you're walking into it, it does feel like you're you're in a game. Like let's yeah. use basketball for an example. Like when you when when you're walking in as the individual, when there's more team that's theirs versus yours, mm -hmm. well, it, yeah, yeah. it feels there's a weird energy or like a weird maybe power or authority situation where you're going. No, no, for me to like control this or run this or to bring the like level of creativity or un variable of unknown, there has to be the right dynamic. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then and and it's crazy because like one of my best friends runs and he does all like the car commercials in LA or yep. for like Kia yep. and Honda, and I'm like, bro, you're the man. You're like the man on that set. That, yeah. Like you know, and he's like, dude, I'm not the man. The first AD is <laughs> the the for, yeah. He's like, but then he's like, but then Honda execs will come in or yeah. Kia execs will yeah. come in, and he's like, they become the man. Yeah. Because then it becomes us like children trying to hide from them. Yep. Trying to create while they're not watching so we can get it done. We literally would, you uh, know, a few times on that commercial campaign would unplug the camera and just, and we'd be like, we're reloading. And I would quickly get a couple of shots because oh, there was literally this camera company wouldn't let me shoot flares. And that's like all I shoot. Like I love <laughs> And like, because they're like, 
they were Japanese and they were like, this this makes our lenses look bad. So it's yeah, like, yeah. yeah, you literally have to play yeah, tricks. Like, no, you can't. No, I think uh, yeah, when there's when there's fear in your creativity, you were, you were saying that he's I, I think this is you're seeing a shift, but this is why there's that tyrant director idea, like the director's yelling on set, because I used yeah. to think a lot of the time the way of the past was directors had to be such children. They had to be such temperamental yeah. that the power dynamic was people didn't want this person screaming at them, including yes. the agency, yes. that they, but they knew the results they were getting. So the director had to create this, and I know one of them kind of mentored me for a bit, was like they had to create chaos on the set so that yeah. everyone was like, when the director's getting his shot, then, then it's peaceful. So then yeah. it was like people were working around this temperament, and yes. that's how you could, you had this giant corporation, how do you attack them? You, you scream, but then sometimes yeah. the corporations would just fire them, but it feels like <laughs> yeah. it feels yeah. like it had to be that way because back in the day with film sets, yeah. you'd have to have more people and everything costs more money. Yeah. Now, as I think that's slowly weeding out because more and more people are able to just shoot intimately with like a couple yeah. of cameras. And so if you're screaming in a documentary with just you and the camera, no, <laughs> like- No, yeah, it's like- It doesn't work. Who are you talking to? Yeah, exactly, you know? yeah. Yeah, it does. It, there's a difference, right? Of like this, the, 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 maybe the past time directors that were really orchestrated this massive set mm -hmm. versus these guys now I mean you, you included or even just us here it's like the, when you bring intimacy to something you get intimacy our, our whole last conversation with someone was went a completely different turn because I think we just had this like desire to strip we have a desire to strip things down yeah and then yeah. even now just us being able to do it in a room that isn't our studio you get such a different conversation it's true hey you yeah know? it's like I think not not having to uh, pull in all of the things that you feel is the way it should be like should be i think is a really is a really bad thing in art you're like well it should be this way it's like well i don't know it doesn't have to be and so yeah. i've been learn finally learning that at, th at this stage of my career i'd say like you know 15 years in that i'm like when i'm when i lean into my familiar familiarity in my process that 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 will benefit the art and that doesn't mean i should like squelch my creative growth but process is actually like you know, Marshall McLuhan said, like, the medium is the message. I think your process is part of the art. And, mm -hmm. and, and if you're trying to do someone else's process, mm -hmm. it's going to create different art. And I think that's what I was, commercials never seemed to fit. It, was, it wasn't, it was yeah, yeah, it wasn't my thing. Yeah, I mean, if, even from, like, the design side of things, like, we've, I, I got to operate as, like, a creative director for him mm -hmm. at Mosaic for, I don't know, seven years? I don't know when you actually gave me the title, <laughs> but, or if I ever we did We don't really give it. titles. No, we don't really no, give titles. No. We just give responsibilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. there you go, yeah. I think. <laughs> I think when they started using my credit card for conference purchases, <laughs> that became the title. Um, and I was like, I'm maxed out. Can you guys stop please stop spending money? They gave, you, they they gave you a little <laughs> limit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They get, no, they I put an air tag on that credit card. <laughs> I've been really fascinated. Like we did a thing where we put all of our creatives that would work on the conference. And usually like, and I was at the conference here before and we do it at this really cool theater at the Ace Hotel downtown yep. in, in downtown LA. And which is this old, you know, beautiful, like gothic, theater very ornate very ornate yeah I, yeah and they you know one year I went down to like the green rooms that were to like catacombs underneath the theater wow. and all we had like 30 <laughs> or 40 different creatives that are just volunteers they're just like hidden wow and i was like this is the thing i want to showcase next year mm. and i was like this is the cool to me this is the cool part yeah. like what what are they learning well not to not to not to make anything else small i'm like what they're learning upstairs is so unique but this is the thing that they need to be seeing happen. perhaps upstairs <laughs> is wisdom but downstairs is character yes yes like not that those are, are separate. exclusive like that only people have wisdom yeah. but i mean like but, yeah when you're in the trenches you're, you're learning character oh, that's such a unique way of i would have never th looked at it like that but i think that the reality is that yeah even you, you as someone who has phenomenal character like deep down inside of your catacombs are good things that are happening like you're building that character that produces the wisdom but anyways we put him in a glass box and put him in the lobby the year after <laughs> Did you? yeah and i thought it was uh, too ironic because i was like i kind of like this idea of that you guys are like these crazy animals that, <laughs> that, that they are not allowed like, to don't pet. tap do you have, but don't tap the glass don't tap the glass <laughs> you know don't, don't yeah. yeah yeah but on the other side it was like I want everybody to just like see the like the, like the amount of joy and like ambition that they have when they're creating. And these are these are you know these are, a lot of these guys were volunteers. The best work were these guys were volunteers and who were just doing stuff for Disney or Netflix and all these different people, or like had no idea that they were like talented and didn't have cameras. And we like you know one of our top guys like didn't have a camera. I was like you need to buy a camera. And he's like I have my iPhone. I'm like cool. You do social media for Whole Foods, but maybe you should buy like an actual camera and like now and now he travels all over the world. And it's it's cool to see people be put in a box but that you can actually look in and out of and create you know and well, how did you keep a group of volunteers like that motivated or how did you in la or any of these big cities where you have creatives who 
not that you know there can be ego that can come with with being an artist like how did how did you manage a group of creatives like that yeah i think by 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 um providing them the tools to explore and not trying to like put them inside of like a creative box that we needed mm. and so it was we tried to like manage the ask like hey come suffer with us during conference and not yeah. sleep for a week yeah but i promise you you will have the most fun yeah so like, okay, you, you know, you're gonna take a few days off from your corporate job or, you know, freelancing, like committing these few days of not yeah. taking necessary pay and really committing to like creating something special and yeah. then just letting them run with it. Yeah. And so for me as like, as the creative director, it was like, no, my job is to direct uh, as much funding or as, as much opportunity for you to then be creative, Yeah. you know? Yeah. And so, and that was cool to watch because they were like freaks of nature then. You were like, <laughs> you know, these people with superpowers and then you'd be like, just use them you know yeah. opposed to like i need to sell more tickets to the next conference yeah or to yeah. the next thing that we're doing um so many things can be determined by you know the financial ramifications and when you can free yourself you know it's tough because you know still live inside of a society that like you run a business yeah, a you require business. money to live you, you need money to live and you need money to be generous so yep. you know and to and to create yeah so it becomes this like thing right it's an interesting pairing what were you gonna say no i had a thought no. well, tell us about the community you've built online yeah no not it's, to get too like you know no but i, I to circle into that community just to jump off your thought it, i'm just sitting there hearing about the motivation of these creatives at a live event and i'm like there is something as humans we still love the live event like there's we built coliseums i know my team i have a very tiny humble team and i love them like family but i've never seen them so alive uh with, with the work we were doing except when we did our film festival this year we did our first in-person film festival we've always done it online where we're we run a company called art of documentary or aod uh started it three years ago um and uh our first long you know i thought it was just gonna be like a one-time course and uh and we yeah i was i was happy 50 people joined it and then we had uh in the first 10 minutes when we opened the doors uh, over 100 people joined remember i was i was i had forgotten we were opening the doors i was driving to a cottage and my business partner mike called me he's like mark you, you won't <laughs> believe it and then anyway so we shut the doors at 400 people we're like i was like this is gonna be a customer service nightmare yeah. uh, and then we decided like, you know, we did some Zoom calls and helped them work through some films. And there was about like 40 videos at that time, just taking people through the complete journey of telling a compelling documentary film, like how to find your character. How did I actually, I, the big thing that we did at the first few day videos is, is defining what a good story is and really def like, just really like desire. That is the core of every story is, is a want. Like if, if you don't, if your characters don't want something, they're not, they're not actually a good character for your film and desire is is it can also be said a question you know like what is the question your film is asking what is it seeking and you see a lot of people we were talking about earlier just focusing on topic but it's like a topic is not a story if you could summarize our entire teaching topic is not a story and what desire does your film have so we, we, we created this and I was just like this is my system this is my approach this is how I've understood story and we'll like, hopefully we'll put it out there in the world and see if it works. And people started making their first films and getting into film festivals. So we're like, well, why don't we reopen it? You know, like, and maybe we'll make one sale a week and it can help pay the rent. And then another 500 people joined. And then, yeah. And so Jeez. we're now, we're now three years later, we're just under about 6,000 filmmakers in it. And uh, we just, just this last night, we, we do this thing called the one day. 6,000. Yeah. In, in the, in the, okay. just, just under, I, uh, wow. I'm not totally, I might be doing the past pastoral thing where I think it's like 5,600 and then you, yeah. you round up, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're good, you're good. the congregation size, but no, uh, um, and you know, not all those people are active. People come and go. Actually, I was just on another podcast this morning. Yeah. The camera guy's like, Hey, yeah. I'm in AOD. And then he's like, cool. and then I was asking him, I'm like, oh, what course? He's like, I, I need to be in it more active, you know, but like, um, but uh, yeah, so we, the need we, you know, when you solve a problem in your own life, people might also have that problem. The problem mm. was I came out of film school with a ton of technical ability, mm. knew how to collaborate with others, but I had no idea what a good story was. And I just spent three years and all this money and still couldn't really, I, I think I, I felt what a good story was. Like I could identify, but I couldn't tell you and I couldn't like, created out of nothing I had to like really work it into my edits and eventually like just feel it out on instinct so once I was able to kind of start defining that for myself just I was like just really making my film simple just writing on stickies like like each scene I would just do like post-it notes and start writing down like well, what question is this and then did I answer that question just created a really simple process and then provided that to people and I think a lot of people are like oh like the story isn't this esoteric like I don't have to be a novelist to start my film but what's great about storytelling is 
the depths of complexity just keep going. There's the surface, yeah, I say a story is some, someone who desires something, but then it just keeps going. There's so many layers of, 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 of backstory and like I said, physical and existential journeys, all of this. Um, but now uh, it's been just the most fun. I, I thought I was always just gonna be a filmmaker, but I, you know, I come from a long line of like teachers and preachers on my mom's side. So I was like, maybe that's something I'll do, I don't know. Uh, and it's, this has been one of the most fun things I've ever done in my life. To, to see so many people make their first films or some of our students have gotten, um, I don't, we don't like to call them students, our filmmakers, like they've, they've gotten on to BBC and winning huge festivals now. And now we're, now we're taking the money back in the course and reinvesting, we're starting to fund their films. And we do this, we do this thing called the one day dot competition where you have to shoot a film in 24 hours. And, and, um, and if we think you didn't do it, we'll actually ask to see your like, your, your memory card. cards. Yeah, oh, you're wow. yeah. Like a few times, just a few times where we're like, but people pull it off. They'll go for 24 hours and then you get like a month to edit it. Last night with the door, the submissions shut off and we had, uh, this is our most yet. We had 130 new films sent through. And that's like, that's, incredible, it, that's, man. that's people congrats. like not, yeah. And it's, well, congrats to the community, right? Yeah. For them, like it's, and why we do that is, sometimes too much will, will actually like stop you from completing it. Like if you have too many materials, mm. you won't know how to build the house. But if I just give you one bag, you'll be able to build a shed and then, then you can build like a garage and yeah, then, you know, yeah, you yeah. just keep going. Yeah. So yeah. We, we, we force people because it makes you very focused. And I always get people in our course, if you can't identify your story in one sentence, if you can't tell me what your main character wants or the question your film is asking in one sentence, you don't know your story. And so it makes them, when you go out to shoot for a day, you can't be aimless. You have to be assertive. And then also too, then you don't have, I mean, the most you can have is like, unless you shoot all slow-mo all day, because then that's like three times the footage, but you can't have like more than like five hours of footage or whatever from, and so it helps people not get lost in the edit because that's a place where you can really, project falls off the rails is when you have just too much to work through. Yeah. yeah. Not enough time. Oh, that's amazing. That's 6,000 members. We've got a ways to go. That's, that's incredible. So do people, um, pay annually is there a membership <laughs> i knew like, that was gonna be the question yeah, it's, yeah. it's like how do you get we, well you know we, we i have mean people watching right now i yeah. imagine some of them uh, yeah. are really interested in learning how to make films because yeah. we, we were in los angeles yeah. so tell us how to join yeah well we we're opening up now a few times a year we used okay. to just do twice a year but we're realizing that more you know people always missing out and it'd be six months till we open the doors again so we're moving to kind of three opens we have one for black friday i don't know if this is going to be up before then but we had so many people miss out on september that we're reopening the doors just for four days uh we have five different uh modules right now okay. you know we have the foundations of documentary filmmaking we have the advanced section and what's cool with the advanced is we do weekly feedback sessions so you can book like a little time slot on mm. a group zoom call get your work reviewed or your pitch reviewed cool. and we have create and earn because it's a big hurdle for for most artists is they don't have enough money to survive mm -hmm. and we were realizing people's business models are a hot mess so they're working for a, a real estate company shooting not that there's anything wrong with that but they never get to do the creative thing yeah, yeah, yeah. and then we have a, a one for editing and one for cinematography so yeah if you're just the art of documentary.com you can get on a wait list and find out when we're opening the doors again and we just we just started a thing called accelerators where um it's a premium product and you pay for three months and you get to be in a select group of, you have to actually apply to it. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's, you have like dedicated coaches, weekly calls, uh, private group chat, and um, you get your work reviewed. And we also have some coaches that we've identified both from our community and from our own film careers, Mike and I, um, and they, they'll get on the call. If you need to just chat with them quickly, they will. And so it's like, you know, you know, when you like, uh, with the airline company, you can you can get your private customer service. It's like, you know, there's people who are actively on projects, but mm -hmm. our team, I, I actually hired most of the team through church. I was running a video team at a church in Toronto and my kind of assistant producer, she was so amazing and loved on people so much. And so she just felt, I was like, if I'm gonna build a community, you need to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Her name's Kim and she's just, the, so many people when they come to our in-person events, they're like, is Kim here? Because <laughs> she's the one answering the emails. And <laughs> That's she's, so yeah, fun. Yeah, she's, That's so, she's, so fun. So are there, there's some common like um, mistakes you see people make when they begin the filmmaking process? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the first thing when it comes to documentary is uh, people treat it like a podcast. They think the interview is is God and it is part of it, but they'll just, the, the, all they'll focus on is where's the interview and did I get them to say everything in their story? And then it'd be just, we, I say it becomes a Wikipedia page because then we're just hearing them tell their story. We never get to see it. So people f treat their audiences 
like dummies. They think they have to telegraph and say every single thing and every detail about the story for people to understand it. But you can show so much. And I think moments of silence in a film allow the audience to begin to think about the story more. And so I find people over explain and rely too much on interviews and then just have what we call aimless B-roll. We're always like, if we if we had to identify a system, we're like, you're an assertive filmmaker. Like, And assertive sometimes is being is listening and following what's happening. But then also assertive is like, oh, I know this happened in your life. So let's go get shots of you back in that environment. You know, not just like let aimless is like, well, oh, I like your sneakers. I like this lighting here. Yeah, it's like, yeah. then you have B-roll like footage in your film that means nothing. And so I would say another mistake, yeah, is people don't realize how much meaning is in every frame of their film. Like, you know, like I really appreciate my mom. She's always put Rembrandt photos up in our house. And I remember as a kid, we had the prodigal son one, like where he's on his knees. And I think it's Rembrandt. Um, That's very expensive. It, yeah, yeah. She was original. <laughs> 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 yeah, I know. Um, she stole it from a church. Um, and uh, but I just, you could just stare at that for like, I mean, my attention span, maybe I stare at it for like a minute, but like, still that's one frame. And there's so much that's being said in that. I actually remember my Oma, we had this really beautiful painting in her house. She went through every aspect of the painting once that like, there's three, you know, there's three circles in this window and that's the Trinity. And that's like, I remember just like, and there's like this dove coming down and it's the seven lines and seven lines is it's the number of perfection. And I was like, there's so much meaning in this, in this one frame. And so as a kid, I would never come back to the house. I'd go stare at that photo on the wall and just know that I was like, this is a story. And maybe, maybe that was like, you know, without her knowing that was, was planting those seeds of, of juxt, juxtaposition um, or, or metaphor. And so, yeah, I think the big mistake is a lot of filmmakers just treat it like a podcast and then, and then treat their, their, footage that they're incorporating into it is just as like I don't know just like last minute decisions yeah I, I love the statement that every frame has a story mm -hmm. I don't know why but um years ago we used to, I used to work a lot more in filmmaking and we worked on this film and a shot that always haunted me that I hated so much that I had a, some part to do with was um I had a story they wanted me to direct I ended up letting one of my friends direct it just to give him a chance yeah. to get his career yeah. going and in it, I don't know why he shot the phone before it rang to let you know the phone's gonna ring. Mm. <laughs> and uh, it always drove me crazy going, most people are intuitive enough to know. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> when you hear the ring, <laughs> the fact that it's a phone. Yeah. Yeah. And I think sometimes, you know, it's, it's we, th we think it's art when we make it linear, didactic yeah. and clear. Yeah, yeah. And and yeah. it's there's some to me some part of art that forces you to intuitively connect dots yeah and it's that's more fun what, you're you're part of the, yeah. the experience then and i think people don't realize when when you're creating art what you want to do is leave enough space for that person's imagination and their experience mm. to fill in the blanks yeah and and that's when you're in the story yeah you're almost like imposing your own story into the other person's story so do you feel so now there's there must be some kind of internal tension now that you have this community that's like yep. blowing up. Yeah. That I imagine is far more lucrative than documentary filmmaking. Absolutely. Doc, we say if you don't like, <laughs> don't do docu documentary filmmaking as a career. That's why yeah. we have Create and Earn. We're like, we help you run your business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your docs will very rarely make you money. They'll make you money, but it'll be over such a long period of time. It, it's like, that, yeah, 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 you'll yeah, have to be yeah, living yeah. at your parents. So yeah. Yeah. do you live with your parents? Uh, no, I do not. No, okay. I currently do not. <laughs> yeah. 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 Currently they, 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 thanks to AOD. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but so is there, is there tension to, you know, you know, to, to teach and to do? Yeah, yeah. So I really struggled to start my YouTube channel because I was so afraid that I was like, I don't want to be a YouTuber. Um, but then I thought long and hard about it and I couldn't shake it. And, and I think that's because I inherently enjoy teaching. So what I did is I actually started my YouTube channel in my, in my condo at the time. And I wanted to know if I'm going to do this, I need to know, will I enjoy it? Because when you're passion and schedule line, you kind of feel some creative fulfillment. And so I, I, I shot a YouTube channel for four months and never released anything. I wanted to know if no one's watching, A, can my ego survive? Because I was like, I, don't, I was afraid too. I was like, if I'm doing this, is this, I don't know. Is it because I want people to hear my voice? And I'm like, and then, so I did, essentially ran a YouTube channel and never have never released those videos. But it was, I wanted to know if I do this, will can i enjoy it without anyone watching and can i enjoy it on my own and i found after four months i was like oh i actually enjoy this process i enjoy sitting down and going what's a problem that i've learned to solve in my career or what's a topic i want to talk about but then i, I say this and 
in my first YouTube video I ever released is I said, this channel is, I want to help bring you along the journey of my film directing. I want to help you make better stories, but I also want it to help be a place where I get to connect with people around the world and create more, more documentary stories. So the way I would say my setup, my business is it's, 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 it's three parts. It's we, me and Mike, who he's the co-founder of AOD. He's a, he's shot like five feature documentaries. He's won Austin film festival. Like he's, he's doing amazing stuff. He's working with HBO. He's, uh, we both have said that we can never stop making films. That's why we, we've been able to create this platform is because we had the experience. So the way it is, is we make our films and then I talk about some of that process on YouTube and then YouTube sends people to AOD and they find community. And then came, now we're finding AOD is now the, the economic engine for us and that's funding our films and funding other people's films. So tried to always build my business so that they all talk to each other, but in one direction. So the, the good thing about that is if you can immediately identify when one's failing. When no one's joining AOD, we're like, when have I been releasing YouTube videos? No. And it's like, mm -hmm. if I'm not making films, we're like, well, are we taking money out of it to create that time, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's like, that's why I'm traveling for yeah. Europe. Yeah. But yes, to come back, Mike and I even had a conversation last week and it's like, well, yeah, it feels like we're, we're running businesses, not making films right now. Mm -hmm. And we know there's seasons, there's seasons to build. You know, you, mm -hmm. you, you in Canada, everyone builds like crazy in the summer because then the ground freezes in the, in the winter. And I'm, mm -hmm. you know, building home right now and they're, they're not gonna be working through the winter. It's like, <laughs> you know, you try to get yeah. the, the framing so that you can work on the inside. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. there's different moments. I keep telling myself that like, yeah, we're in a season of building AOD and and uh, and the, the, when the next film comes, it will. But if, if I'm sitting here a year from now saying the same thing, that's <laughs> that's yeah, when I'll yeah. know, you know. <laughs> but it's also too, I was just going through all the best directors of all time because I was looking at their combination, their, their collaborations with DPs. I was mm. deep into Wikipedia yesterday and there's some amazing, some of the best directors of all time. There'd be like three, seven years. Terrence Malick made a film in 1979 and didn't make like another one until like, yeah. Thin Red Line, I think. Yeah, yeah. He made Days of Heaven and then just like disappeared for 20 years. So you're, you're this idea that you have to be making a film every year. I don't know if you'll be making all your best films. Like, mm. you know, so it's uh, it's picking and choosing your battles. Right now we do, I am enjoying building this community and, and we're starting to executive produce a lot of films. So I'm like, we'll do that for a bit. But it's yeah, really cool. I have to be making films. It, it's interesting though, because it feels like you guys are taking back almost the studio system a little bit. Like you guys are becoming- on very tiny like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. On, but, but on some level, like you're taking this and going, you know what, we're actually, we, we're going to invest in the things that we care about yeah. and tell the stories. Yeah, yeah. No, we, we've recognized that AOD, because we're a global community in 70 countries, our community, we always remind them like, you there's untold stories you you have a perspective you have a process and you and you have people around you that we don't have access to and you need to identify those and so we're able to help tell like the first film ever or documentary film i think was nanook of the north and it was just a camera person and and uh and um an indigenous person in the north of canada it was just two people you know just a tiny film crew and we're like that's where documentary started documentaries now on Netflix it's like they have these big interviews and you know you watch all these murder mystery shows they're just an ex it's just a different genre of like scripted film essentially it's not really a documentary and so it's not that we're opposed to that but there is something about a person with a camera following a character who has desires and so we're trying to reclaim that and those Netflix won't fund those films you know your your studio systems won't fund those but those films only take 15 20 grand to film uh, to fund so um do I need to repeat that? No, no I think we're I'm, okay. I'm, 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 I'm the, the filmmaker. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've already prefaced it. Yeah, perfect. We, yeah, I like yeah. it. No, we're 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 in the we're in the midst of art being built. Um, yeah. But yeah, so it's it, those films don't need much money. They just yeah. need a really passionate filmmaker. So mm. if we can come alongside, and what we've noticed is most of the people in our community can get their films eighty percent of the way there, and that's where you were talking about the coach. You just need a that extra little perspective at the end. Mm. And it's like just a few small changes can go such a far away. Um, so yeah, we, we just did our first one in Toronto, and mm -hmm. we're the plan is to do one um, either in New York or, or LA next year. So we're, I think you should do it with us. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Please. Yeah. We used to do a film festival every okay. year, and people from all over the world come, but we've never done a documentary film festival. Well, yeah. Is that Heck what you yeah. get? Is it all documentaries? It's all documentaries. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. have two locations. Come. I think a one really, of them in LA. I, I mean, I you know I think a really fun story for you. To tell because I was struck by how you're going to be traveling, yeah, because your staff's all over the world. I mean, I think a great documentary would be the um, like the story of a storyteller, mm. where you take like the ten most interesting documentary filmmakers you have in the world, 
and weave their stories together and show how there's like a common human story mm. in people who tell the stories because there is something unique about people who are driven to tell stories. Yes. Yes. What, what have you identified in that? Like, what, what do you what do you see, or what's your thesis on that? I think sometimes it's um, people who are desperate to understand themselves, mm. and is understanding the world around you. You can sometimes that's an extension. Yeah, it's you know it's therapy in yeah. a unique way. What about and people who are afraid to understand themselves? Because it's easier to an psychoanalyze someone else. They don't make good storytellers. Okay. Yeah, they're less because is that. And why is that? Are they, they're just not as in Because tune? they're not honest about their own story. Okay. I mean, I, I think a huge part of what helps a person become a really powerful storyteller is how much they tell themselves the truth about themselves, about their own pain, about their own flaws, about their own shortcomings, about their own fears, insecurities. And, and then you become more, I think the more you become aware of all the textures inside of your soul, the more you're able to see it in the story that you're trying to capture. Yeah. You also know when- Wait, hold, on, hold on, Do you agree with that? Because I, I, I sense some hesitation. No, I'm just, I'm thinking about the, the from my brain, when people start talking, I make 10 connections and I'm thinking about the, the notion of that humans are the only species that can lie to themselves and believe it's truth. So I, I'm listening to Erwin talk about that. I'm like, I'm always, yeah, I'm always concerned. I'm like, where have I lied to myself just to get out of a responsibility in my own life. And then if you say it enough times, you start believing it, right? And so then I'm like, as a storyteller, that's why I have a pact, I have two really close friends. And we've always said like, we need to be brutally honest with what we're going through. Because I've had close friends in the past where you find out all this interesting stuff about them later on. And you're like, oh, I actually didn't know you. I was yeah, actually, yeah. I was hanging that's out right. with, a, with a character in a script. I didn't actually know you. So we've said like, we want to be able to look back 10 years from now and say we knew each other. Sorry, sorry, that's no, that, no, no, that, no, that no, was what was no, going on in my that's head. Well, what I'm hearing is he agrees with me 100%. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I, I, did, I felt something and I, I didn't want you to go on without identifying yeah, it. Because no. this is an interesting conversation about what it takes. Yeah, because I think when I watch a great documentary, what I'm really grateful for is uh, he didn't accept the lie. Yes. Like yes. He, he saw the lie and he had the courage to plow to the truth. Is this, sorry, is this the filmmaker or the character? The filmmaker. The filmmaker, yeah. Like the, the filmmaker is a lie detector yeah. in a documentary. That's what you have to show both sides. And we're in an era right now where, where a lot of documentaries propaganda. Propaganda is just when you show one side and uh, it's, that's, yeah, that's, 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 that's just propaganda. I mean, I won't say it's bad art because it can be a beautiful film, but I don't think it's a doc. We were always taught, I really appreciate my doc teacher in, in film school always would say like yeah, yeah there's there's always two sides he would tell us he's like if you need to watch the news he's like watch al jazeera and fox news he's like and find and the truth will be in the middle is what yeah, he tells yeah. us. Yeah. No. i mean the most powerful storytelling to me is when the person seems to agree with both sides yeah it's not when they present both sides yeah it's when it's it's uncomfortably weird yeah. that you feel like wait a minute this person is agreeing with both sides yeah. and that's not right they have to pick a side <laughs> i know I, so, I really hate all these nutrition documentaries they've you know because not because i disagree with them well, some of them i do but because you know right from the front cover you're like i know the filmmaker is uh is a, is a vegan or they're or a carnivore <laughs> it's like you just yeah. know and i'm yeah. like so i'm like i'm just gonna hear all your friends talk mm -hmm. about why you you know it's like but if you really believe, if you really believe you have the truth, you'll mm -hmm. let it stand up against uh, the, the, the opposite ideas. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, otherwise, yeah, you're going back to what you said earlier, like yeah. you want to create a revolution or, or, or mm -hmm. talk to a group of people. It's like, yeah, tell a story, you know, and have control of that narrative. Yeah. And yeah, when Aaron and I used to shoot a lot of documentaries 10 years ago, <laughs> I mean, one of the best feedback, so where we got, because I went to one city, asked, well, actually, Aaron got the interview in, I came, own, uh, in, Calgary. in Calgary. Yeah. And I asked the person who was a, a billionaire, why did you say yes to the interview? Mm. And he said, because I called a friend of mine in Vancouver when you did a, a documentary there and they said, you need to do this. It'll be like therapy. You'll learn things about yourself. Wow. You didn't know. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> no. That's funny. What was and, his name? And Brett Wilson, was it? Brett, Brent, Brett Wilson? Brent. He was on like the original, I, I guess the I guess Shark Tank was originally. It's called Canadian. Dragons Den. Dragons Den. I think he was one of the guys. Yeah, one of the, the, the OGs on that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I yeah. just Facebooked his assistant. 
Yeah, it's so funny. It's if so you go crazy. watch Dragon's Den, they're like, you know, you watch Shark Tank and they're like, we have a $10 million valuation. We're asking for this. You watch the Canadian one. They're like, like we have an $80,000 evaluation. <laughs> <laughs> Can you pay my rent? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's just so funny. Yeah. yeah. No, that, was a, that was a cool interview. That was a cool interview. Back yeah, I just think it's really, to me, like one of the gifts you can give someone, even when you're telling the story, is is taking them through a journey that's yeah. both like therapeutic because they're able to get things out that maybe were trapped inside of them. Yeah. And also to be seen yeah. and understood yeah. is a really, I think a significant gift every human being yeah. wants in their life. Yeah. No, I that and, is truly like one of my favorite parts of documentary is the interview, even though I was saying like, don't just rely on it. But I think people don't realize the the that there there's purpose in most of the decisions and when when do you just sit down and someone ask continue asks you why you're like okay so why are you running this race well because of this well why well because you know my dad died when he was this age so why are you running well I want to make sure I can live past it you know and then you and they're like well why do you want you know why why and yeah. and then suddenly they realize like how much meaning there is in everything they're doing and I was just interviewing an MMA fighter this week for just short doc and he we did the interview the night before and he just kept saying halfway through he's like i've never thought about these things <laughs> you know yeah. he's like, i never thought it. and and even like the the next day right before we were leaving he was like can we do another interview so we hopped in the truck and he just gave me yeah. a bunch of gold because he's like i actually i laid in bed last night and i just kept thinking i've never thought about this you know and that's that's so, that's so fun to just have the gift to be able to because you're not a therapist and mm. so people are probably more likely willing to bring you into their life. And so, you know, or some people want mm. that, but uh, yeah, I, I love that part of, uh, of documentary. Is there a story you wish you could tell that you've not yet told? Yeah, I would love to see, um, I can't, can't say one of them, I, I don't. Oh, I would like to do a story uh, I would like to actually bring some physics in there. Sorry, I'm, I'm thinking of all the story ideas I have written down. Actually, <laughs> he's no. Gatekeeping. I can tell you. He's, he's I am, getting, he I went, am, he went I to am, number maybe, one and went, nah. I'm, I'm going go, through yeah. all of them. Like, I, I don't have. There, no, there's one I really want to do, which I'll tell you about after. Uh, because I've, <laughs> if I've, I'm, why I'm being cagey about it is, is I've, no one's made a film about it. And I can't believe this. Like, I cannot believe this. And it fascinates me. But I would, I like. So are you going to make a film on it? I think no. I I would I'd like to. I would like to. No. If I I want to. No. I want to speak to Errol Morris about it and like if I, he doesn't know me yet, but I think I have a connection there. But yeah. <laughs> and there's a specific reason probably unlock. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No. But I, I would. I, I definitely want to make a film about this. But mm -hmm. uh, I'm also really. I'm finding that I'm finding a connection to God through physics lately, and I, I I'm thinking I'm trying to figure out a way to make some mm -hmm. films about that. Maybe they're just YouTube shorts, but uh, I could go off about gravity and about turbulence and why I think those are like mm. such fascinating dynamics of, of, of surrounding us. Yeah. That's awesome. I love yeah. It. How about you? What, what's it. a book you, you haven't written yet? And I actually have a question I would like to ask you after, <laughs> or no, actually maybe on the, can I ask? Yeah. yeah, yeah we have time. Yeah, we have plenty of time. I, I, okay. I wasn't sure if we were wrapping no, up. No, no, oh, no, I, no. Well, no, what's I'm a just book? I'm not sure how much lo longer the noise will hold back. So we'll keep yeah. going. Yeah. Go, go, for, it, go for it. Is there, um, well, for both of you, I think, I think you were talking about recently on the podcast about that you, you you're like the idea of writing a book, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. I, there's you're always an idea. Yeah. Yeah, there's always an but, idea. But if you if you could like not lose, I'm sure there's so many books on your minds or ideas, but if there was a, almost not a frivolous idea, but that one that you're like, I'll never do that because it, it doesn't seem like, like if I have X amount of time to write books, what's one idea though that that's on the back burner that you you've, would just be so, that you think would be so fun to write about? I mean, the first one comes to mind is 20 years ago, I actually had a six figure contract for a novel and um, based on a small section of Ecclesiastes. Hmm. And I was starting to write the book. And at that time, um, Kim and I were still in the earlier part of our marriage and she felt it was wrong for me to write a novel that was nonfiction um, out of a passage in the Bible. Hmm. And so I, I stopped and basically gave back that wow. you know, advance. Wow. Was and that tough? Uh, yeah, it was really tough. And uh, and then later, ironically, a year later, the book, The Shack came out. Oh, okay. And yeah, she read yeah. that and I said, why is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember saying to her when she was telling me you shouldn't do it, I said, wait a minute, but Tolkien did it. Yeah. And Lewis did it. Yeah. And you love these people. Yeah. And she said, you're not Tolkien or Lewis. <laughs> 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 and, uh, so I would love to go back and actually 
writing that script. Write, write some, it's it's a it's a film. Is um, it a film or a book? It's both a film and a book. Ah, you know. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I feel like one day I need to go back and and, it, and write wh that story. Why not write fiction as your next book? I do love writing fiction. I do have. I just wrote a graphic novel. It's oh, I say. Aaron has been supervising the artwork. I was going to say you have, a, you have an artist. No, right? we don't. I just fired. We the had to artist. just fire our artist because it yes. didn't yeah. meet the standard I yeah. wanted for yeah. the graphic yeah. novel. Do you have okay. an artist? Um, do you have, uh, yeah, no, we, we can talk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that'd be awesome. Yeah. I mean, the Watchmen is still one of my favorite books, like like graphic novels. That's are. interesting. So, yeah, yeah, so I have that graphic novel done and I have, uh, I, my writing history began writing science fiction. Yeah. Mm. And I just never released any of it. I, I started writing science fiction when I was probably 10, 11, 12 years old. Yeah. And that's, you that, know. that's kind of what I feel about the film I that I'll t is, it is, it's kind of deviates from the themes that I've been working on, but to me, it's such an incredible story that no one has t spoken about that I'm like, it would just be so f fun. And I think that's that's okay. Because I've always kind of like, when, when if I'm in church settings, mentoring people for video, I, I've just always said like, you, your, your films don't disciple people, you do. And when I finally came to that realization, it took the pressure off my art. I think we make really bad art in church because we try to make the film take people through every step of their faith. But uh, I've since I've taken that pressure off my art, I've felt that I can, you know, be mentored or mentor people better, and then my my art gets to exist the way it should. Like like it's to inspire, it's to make ask, help people ask bigger questions or for people to feel seen. But if it's always like if you're trying to have it like mentor and disciple people, it's it's yeah. it's, it's it's a different genre. That's not that's not mm. what you're creating. I love. Were you gonna ask? You're gonna say? Yeah. Answer what? Yeah. What? What's, what's, what, what book do you want to write? Or is it, is it, is it know, a book? No, I, you know, I, I, I think I said it on the pod and I think in the, in the moment I said it, I think there was something else, but lately it's been like something around, like the, the word that keeps coming back is like uh, the creative way, mm. talking about how, because I would say I would, I would, like I was a creative director, but I was really a creative adjacent until I became, until I got like more hands-on to, to design. My background was in editing, my background yeah. was in film, I went yeah. to film school and then kind of left that to go into clothing and then always learn the artistic nature of the process. But then I usually leave it at that. I've never become like the master of yeah. how to sew, yeah. the master of how to edit. I just edited well enough to get, you know, the little white girls at school to like pay me to edit their reels, you know, like it was always enough to just the side hustle, but it was like how, you know, but then doing enough of that in, two, in different ways helped me to have an understanding of, of the broad nature of creativity and the process of it. So like how to really create, you know, like a simple, like maybe pilgrimage of, of how to be creative or even just like understanding that the process is a part of, of yeah, the creativity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think the, the that hasn't never always been done well, but I think is it the, is it the art of war or the war of yeah, art? The war, war of art, war of art. Yes. Yeah, like books like that yeah. are, are actually really helpful yeah. to, I think so much of the cre creativity is getting over imposter syndrome, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then from there, I've, I've enjoyed, uh, you know, even um, Mind Shift was, uh, was reading that book on a, on a retreat recently. And like really, I, uh, th thank you for writing it because I've always, like I, since I got into filmmaking, I would like, sometimes I bring a pillow to film school. Like I would like stay overnight and just work like crazy. And, and I've always found that I have two, kind of two gears in life, like fast and really fast. And so it was affirming to read, like that is part of your gift is that you, you are obsessed with a craft or, or an idea, but you did obviously talk about the idea of responsibility and, and being, you know, mm -hmm. like, like, a good friend, a good father, these different roles you have in life. What's advice to, to, to people, perhaps like, you know, like myself, where, how do you, how do you manage passion and responsibility? Like what are, I'm trying to remember what I wrote, the questions I wrote down in that journal. Again, if it's on the Air Canada flight, if, um, <laughs> no, but if, when, what are the indications in your own life that, that are flagging you, that you're leaning too far in one way you're being over responsible so you're not taking the risks in your passion or you're being over passionate so you're neglecting your your responsibility like what is there is there check engine lights that that you would see or or in your own life what it, when yeah. have you noticed i i find very few people actually have those two tensions equally mm. i think some people tend toward um if you want to use the word responsibility rather than passion you know mm -hmm. i'm not sure if that's the divide but choose let's just use that yeah they would end up being overly responsible, always using responsibility as an excuse to not pursue their passions. And I find other people, they're completely driven by their passion or their ambition or their dream or yeah. their desire. 
and they would use it completely to justify not taking I'm, responsibility so I'm for providing for my family. So I'm going to work on this all yeah, the time. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and neglecting relationships. So I think the reality is very few people have both of those. And so you need to look in the mirror and figure out which one of those two you are. Okay. And then go, okay, I'm a type A, A plus. And so I'm going to need to realize that my checks and balances is I need to make sure that my life is about people. And I'm never going to know. I'm always going to think I'm right. Mm. So I need to have the people I love yeah. be able to speak into my life. Yeah, yeah. And so you just need to realize that your, your compass for the other half is broken. Yeah. And so you need to have... So yeah, rather than trying to be the holistic company, you need yeah. the people around in you. your life. Yeah. And then if you're the high responsibility person who gives up your ambition, your passion, your drive, you need you need to have people in your life who are highly ambitious, highly driven, who are also speaking your life, calling out your potential, yeah. and, because you have a responsibility to your talent yeah. and your relationships. Yeah. It's not one or the other, and you, you know, it's, I think it's rare when people seem to have somehow a a, a gravitational pull to both yeah. and um and so most likely you're not if you're listening to that rare person you have a, a pull one to the other yeah. and then even when you have a gra gravitational pull to both you you find yourself being pulled back and forth throughout your life yeah. you, you know and yeah so i that's just what i would say just looking at inside of myself i just would always have that pull inside of me and realizing I move really fast yeah. and there are just not many people in life that are going to be able to move at my speed. And it would be very frustrating going, well, how do you have community if people can't move at your speed? And you have to realize uh, if you're a speedboat, then it's your responsibility to pull down your engines and get back over to the, to the cruise ship yeah. <laughs> and spend time with the people on the cruise ship. And don't use the fact that you're moving fast as an excuse to not slow down to get with them. They don't have to keep up with you. If you're the one who moves fast, it's your responsibility to slow down and re-engage and connect. And it's not, you can't go, it's equal. It's not. The person who cannot move as fast cannot catch up with you. The person who moves fast can slow down. And on that note. I think we might just need to end this thing. Yeah. <laughs> I think that that's the beep that says we've... We're done. Uh, we, we've oh. brought this conversation can I, can close. I, yes, you can cut this. Go, I, there's one last question. Go, 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 uh, this was the one go, I wrote go. down. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you both. Is, is, is stress a decision? Is, is stress is, a decision? Is stress a choice or is it an event? You want to go first? Can you no, choose no, to no, be... You go. Can I choose to be stressed? Yeah, do, that, I guess here's one way of asking it better. Do we choose to be stressed? I don't know if we choose it, but I like it. We mm. were talking about that today. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I, like I, I, I had asked him a question. I said, um, <laughs> we were talking about one of, our, one of our, our guys we work with. He's the head coach of the Los Angeles Rams football team. Mm -hmm. he's, uh, I think he was the youngest coach to win a Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now, but the, you know, he's two seasons away from that. His last season was the worst season. Yeah. Uh, to, from Super Bowl winner to like the next season was the worst drop off in history. So he's, he, and a lot of people were thinking that maybe, I'm just gonna keep going, is that cool? Yeah. Uh, well, a lot of people were thinking maybe he'd go into sports casting or maybe he would like take like a front office job. Yeah. And I asked him, I said, if you were the youngest, you know, uh, winning football Super Bowl champion, would you take an office job? That would probably involve a lot of high stress or yeah. would you go and become a sports caster, get the biggest check ever and then just walk away into the sunset? Well, the, you asked me this very specific dilemma. Would I choose to become president and CEO of a professional sports team or a yeah, become the GM. celebrity sportscaster. Yeah. Getting paid a ridiculous amount of money. And I said, being a sportscaster would be fun. Yeah. It would be like going surfing every day for me. It yeah, would yeah, be yeah, 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 the yeah. easiest job yeah. in the world. Yeah. And it would be very low stress for me. Mm -hmm. Being the president, CEO, and our general manager of a football team, my job being based on success and failure would be so high stress that I would definitely choose it. <laughs> huh, wow. Yeah. Well, no, he didn't, he didn't say that at the end. He just left it there. And I was like, oh, so it's an obvious answer. Yeah. yeah. I know what you would choose. You choose yeah. the high stress job. That's cool. I, I, his stress, I think stress is misidentified. Okay. Maybe, maybe that's where I'd go with it. Yeah. I would go that stress is the thing that, that maybe, um, 
I, don't, I wouldn't say it fuels it because I think the ambition and the 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 idyllic nature of like the outcome of the create the creative process would be something that I I desire. I don't know. Stress is just I don't know. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just turbulence. Maybe it's just something you know that when you're in the air, you're gonna feel. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily kill you, or you hope to God it doesn't. Yeah. And maybe in the middle of it, you're like, maybe I should just. I hope to God we die quickly. <laughs> you know. Um, I think it's just something it's unavoidable at times. But I do think there are times where you can avoid it, and then you should when when in those moments. I don't know. I don't have a I don't have a clear answer. What's yours? I think stress is like gravity. Okay. We all experience the gravitational pull every second of our existence. When you're young and strong and you stand up straight, you're fighting the force of gravity. Mm. As you grow older and you become weaker, you actually are submitting to the force of gravity. Hmm. You don't actually stop standing up straight because you're old. It's because you no longer have the strength to wow. resist gravity. Wow. I think stress is like the gravitational pull. And when you don't want any stress in your life, you actually just crumble and become yeah. flat. Yeah. When you decide to stand up straight, you go to war against the force of that stress. Mm. And so some people, when they say they're never stressed, I'm wondering if they're ever pressing the full capacity that's inside of them because st stress is a, the powerful force of limitation and us refusing to accept those limitations. But when people say they're stressed out and I look at their lives and they're not doing anything, yeah, I realize, oh, they've just crumbled That's under the gravitational good, pull yeah. of stress. They haven't been in the gym. Yeah. yeah. I think you need to get in the gym, work out and learn how to stand up straight. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, you have to willingly introduce yourself expose yourself to stress yeah and, and, and to pain yeah, yeah and then your capacity increases yeah yeah you know, that that little infant is laying there and doesn't understand the power of stress because they're just laying there hmm. and then the moment they get curious they try to lift their head and they're that's when they start fighting the gravity yeah yeah and then when they crawl then when they walk and then you know when they're standing and every step of human development is deciding gravity will not hold you back. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's the same with stress. It's like, uh, of course, I'm always gonna experience stress because I'm never going to accept my status quo. Cool. And yeah. so I think you should see stress as this wonderful reminder of you can, this is your limit today. Yeah. Do you wanna press beyond that? Yeah. yeah. And be able to I take on it. more. Yeah. So go go get stressed. Go get stressed. What do you think? Of it? You, there's obviously there's a that was a leading question. No, no, I, I I want I genuinely wanted it was something I was I was I was journaling about it and I was like, okay, you can't decide if you're going to experience stress. Mm. Things happen. We had stuff stuff happen. Yeah, we got an unexpected huge bill in AOD that we're like working through right now, and it was like so that's stress. I don't have the decision. I have the decision of what to do with that stress. Mm -hmm. I'm like I can crumble under this or we can rise up mm -hmm. and I can learn and then I'm and so yeah I think you have the decision you can't avoid stress or if you want to avoid stress I think it's such a, the gravity thing mm -hmm. is such a helpful metaphor because it's like yeah if you want to avoid stress then go live a safe life but then you'll actually crumble mm -hmm. because you won't have the, the atrophy um, but but also too I think over exposure to stress I, I learned this my mm -hmm. running has always been so helpful for me in mm -hmm. life is I've realized overtraining is a thing. That's right. And and you can act like you never thought. And I realized that's why I was really bad at triathlons because I had no system. I would just go crazy and I would always get sick mm -hmm. and just like I just would push myself to the limit all the time because I thought, no, I'll just get better. But I was overstressing my body. Mm -hmm. It's and but being being smart about this stress exposure, but also pushing yourself. Like mm -hmm. I, I had a, I actually had like a running coach for the first time to try to hit this personal best. And he would look at my times and all that. And he was it's Eric Floberg. He's awesome guy and he would just be like you need to go to the well on this next workout mm -hmm. what he would mean by that is like you need to act, he's like you need to really deplete yourself like it, it needs to suck and like so <laughs> you know but then, then the next day he'd be like just just cruise like mm -hmm. just cruise on your workout and just mm -hmm. add some sprints at the end yeah and remember emotions are not stress are they a symptom of something they're are they're, they're, they're your response to stress okay it's just when people ask about being wrong wrong like you know how do you how do you feel when when you're wrong mm. 
you, you feel exactly the same way as you do when you are right. Because you don't actually feel anything until you realize you're wrong. Hmm. So being wrong doesn't create an emotion. When, you, when you're caught, <laughs> and then you experience shame yeah, or guilt or frustration yeah. or embarrassment. Yeah. So yeah. being wrong doesn't create an emotion. Hmm. It's the realization that you're wrong that creates an emotion. Yeah. Being stressed doesn't create an emotion. It's your response to that stress. It's, oh no, we're gonna fail. Mm. Or, or, oh no, this, this, is, this is the end of our entire company. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's your response to that stress that actually creates the emotional content. Yeah, yeah. That's what you have to remember and realize, okay, the crisis isn't creating the emotion. The crisis is creating the context from which I respond to it. Hmm. Mm. That's, that's, that's empowering because now it's, it's knowing that like, yeah, you will be in, in um, um, amongst chaos, but it's like, then yeah, again, I guess, so it is a decision. Like mm. stress is experienced, but I guess how it affects you is the decision. You know? And sometimes it's a default mode. Yeah. You didn't, it's like, you didn't choose that emotion. It's you're, you've trained yourself to respond with that emotion. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it can become a defense mechanism. One second. Right. Uh, you're just too good to deal with beeping. No, um, it's just like this. I'm stressed right now. All right, we're hearing this, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it can't, it, this can't create an emotion. Oh, it creating it, an emotion. Yeah. It, <laughs> of it creates a <laughs> context reason. for an emotion. Yeah, it's and creating an emotion for your editor. And all three of us might have, or four of us might have yeah. a different emotion right now. Yeah. Aaron's emotion might be based on, I want this documentary. I want this, this mind shift podcast to be amazing. This is killing us. What a legend. I'm not stopping, <laughs> right? You know, so I'm like, it will not stop me. I'm going to go ahead and say my piece. Austin's probably stressed out going, how am I going to edit this? <laughs> how is this going to work? And you're like, I'm just a guest. It's their podcast. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> they should have locked off this location beforehand. They should have, they should have watched module number three. Yeah, and, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. location scouting. yeah. But it's the whole um, point. The same exact circumstance creates different emotions yeah. because of our response to that circumstance. Yeah. yeah. No, I love it. And honestly, when we were, we were looking for a location here, we had a few we could have rented and then I reached out to a friend and, and we got this spot. And I knew there would be variables we couldn't con yeah. control, but I think when we got in here this morning, I was like, oh, this is so much more aesthetically pleasing yeah, beautiful for me. Space. And yeah. it looks amazing on the cameras. And I was like, ah, oh, I'll take these two. I don't even think the person who gave us this location realized this was happening today. Yeah. I mean, she'd be, more, she'd be mortified, but it, it is, uh, there's part of, I love the variable of like the randomness of what can happen, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And when um, you're shooting a documentary, you don't want it to be sanitized no. or sterile. That's what commercials are. That's yeah. why they're not good. And ones. Mind Shift Podcast is not a commercial. Jeez. It's no. real life. Yeah. <laughs> no. But I do wish Scissor Lifts could just turn the little button off. Um, turn the sound off. Hey, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thank you absolutely for having we to, me. We have to do it again. Yeah. And we're going to do this, this film festival in LA. We've got to yeah. do it. Heck yeah, let's do that. I would love that. I would love to bring yeah. Art of Doc and Art of Calm together. That, mm -hmm. I think that would actually be like, pretty pretty beautiful because those those two things go hand in hand like yeah. like verbal for communication is so important mm -hmm. and there's a time to make a film about it but there's yeah. also a time to 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 communicate and and personal and verbal and yeah. i'm also and trying to think of how do we do something with the art documentary with the arena conference yeah, live in la next year i know we've got to find a we've way to like a feature oh, a film at one at the arena conference well we just had 130 come through so maybe uh you know that's, that's like with the one day doc competition 130 new docs that they we, submitted that that's oh. what came through last night it was so awesome i My before i went to bed last night it was like 13 minutes to to midnight yeah and i looked and i was like checking in i was like wanted to see because we do the one day doc competition mm -hmm. twice a year yeah and last one we had 110 films i was like oh hopefully we can beat that and i was looking at it it was like 103 i was like oh. okay. i'm like this this group of uh, aod filmmakers are like pulling back yeah. and then this morning i woke up and kim on our team's like 150 came through and i was like <laughs> in that last 13 minutes <laughs> 47 films came like, you guys are waiting to <laughs> yeah some, some people were waiting on that export file yeah, i know they were like, they were we're sweating it sweating. should have upgraded the yeah. memory should have upgraded yeah. yeah yeah so now our team has our work cut out because we got to watch each one and so oh, uh, yeah is there, a, is there a limit on time 
Um, yeah, yeah we, we, we put a limit now. It's like the films have to be under eight minutes. Okay, um, okay. And I think that's also important because longer isn't necessarily better. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so it, it helps people, again, being assertive, making right decisions. And, and so, yeah, it, that's that's the format. But then we'll be presenting those films online and uh, and we, we take the best ones and put them on our YouTube channel and we actually pay the filmmakers for that. So it's been it's been so fun to 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 be a part of this global filmmaking journey for so many people. That's, I'm just doing. I just want to do the math real quick. So you have so saying that eight minutes. Oh gosh, don't I don't want to hear that math. Divided by sixty. Geez, you got twenty hours of document. That's if everyone hits the eight minutes. But that's pretty wild. Yeah, yeah. That's exciting, man. It's Congrats. cool. Well, what's so cool about that is if we didn't do this competition, there would be 150 less films about people going through great existential crisis or telling about something they've been through. Like these stories, these are untold stories that yeah. you know. And I'm not saying each film of those is amazing, but uh, there's th that's part of everyone. You have to, if you want to be a good filmmaker, you have to go make a lot of bad films. So, oh. Go make bad films. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, but we can't wait to do something together. Yeah, I, I, would, I would love to. Right, thank thanks, you again. Hey, thanks so much for joining us. Of course.